so Secure Socket Layer VPN or SSL uses a web page that prompts for a username password and then allows access to private resources through that web page as a portal. Um, you guys are familiar that, with that already um, based on some of the products we offer. Uh, but you know, basically, you from any computer that has uh, internet access and has a, an appropriate browser, you uh, are directed a URL, log in, and then from that URL you can uh, you can actually access resources. So there's there's actually two types of uh, SSL VPNs that um, correspond to this. One is clientless, where the web page directs to available network resources, but does not allow applications to access private resources. So what I mean by that is like. Um, well, Outlook may be a bad example, but say you pulled up some kind of application that, um, you know, a ticketing system or something that needed to be able to access those private resources on your laptop with a clientless uh, SSL VPN, you wouldn't be able to do that because it's not going to allow applications to access the private resources. You're going to need a thin client for that. So the thin client, what it does is it, uh, it prompts you to install an ActiveX or Java application that's going to allow some applications to work over the VPN as well. So you, know, you basically go to the web page, log in, it prompts you for, uh, to, ins you know, to install that, that application. You, uh, you know, set it up to allow. Once it's installed, at that point, whatever applications uh, your corporation is set for that you know, that program is allowing will be able to also access the VPN resources. So if you had like a, a ticketing system or something like that, you could, uh, you could use that as well. Um, SSL uses a dual key approach one private and one public that can encrypt, decrypt each other. Um, kind of go through the steps on the next slide, but, uh, well, actually that's that's probably be easier that if I show you the steps rather than just looking at this, uh, this drawing. So in this one, we've got PC1 and PC2 on each side. Um, it can work in either direction, but we'll start with PC1 being the, the initiator. So PC1 and PC2 send each other their respective public keys. You know, they, they just send them across, it's a public key, so it's no issue. PC1 generates a shared secret key that will be used to encrypt decrypt data. Uh, PC1 then encrypts the shared secret key using the public key that it received from PC2 and transmits that new tr uh, key across to PC2. PC2 receives that key, decrypts the shared secret key using its private key, and uh, it, it now has the, the, shared secret, the private shared secret key that PC1 previously generated. Now both PCs have the same shared secret key and can encrypt, decrypt all data for the rest of the session. So it's a, it's a multi-step process that prevents you from just uh, the, the public key or something that you're sending across potentially getting um, you know, caught by someone and, um, and you know, de just decrypted. Since you're, you're using that key to encrypt another separate key and then sends that across, it, um, it kind of prevents that, that type of issue from happening. So it's only sending like the, uh, the decryption, the code and decryptor, like one time, as opposed to just sending it across every time it transmits. Right. Well, it's yeah, it's it's sending across keys initially, but those aren't going to be the keys that you use for the actual data. That's that's just going to be a key that you use for uh, encryption decryption of the key that you're generating. Mm -hmm. So, but that you're right though that that key that ends up getting generated that's used as a shared secret key for all of the. Uh, uh, communication thereafter is only sent across one time and it's encrypted. So, so it's kind of like doing a TCP IP handshake once. Kinda, yeah. Like that, that's a fairly good way of um, characterizing it. So if somebody wants to break in and get your data, they have to actually catch that initial first key. They they have to not only catch that uh, first key, they have to catch that first key. They still have to have a private key from uh, PC1 or PC2, and then they have to also catch the encrypted shared secret key as it comes across. So, uh, I mean, it's not—it's definitely not impossible to do, um, but it, it makes it very difficult because you've got that many layers of, um, of encryption going on and different keys being used. Um, so, moving forward from SSL, um, and actually, like, we'll... I, I actually included that part about SSL uh, key exchange. Um, it's actually later in the chapter when we'll start talking about Diffie-Hellman group and the pieces of VPN, but um, I want to include it there because we were already talking about SSL. I'll show you in a second how uh, DH or Diffie-Hellman kind of performs the same or a similar type of process. So 
the, the VPN PC pieces, for site-to-site -site VPN, you need two routers or ASA firewalls um, with an iOS supporting VPN. Not all iOSs support, uh, you know, encryption and VPN and all that kind of stuff. For remote access VPN, you're also going to need a VPN client. Um, so the, the VPN client is like we talked about before, something installed on a, a laptop or a PC. Now Cisco offers its own, uh, the Cisco VPN client, uh, which is a software client you can install. Um, there's also a, a Cisco VPN 3002 hardware client, but that guy is end of life. Um, so it may or may not work with your equipment if you've still got one. Um, you can also use a, a Certicom client, which is a... Uh, kind of an open use generic client. Um, it's kind of just a named third party IPsec VPN software client. Um, you can also use another third party, but you're you're going to be limited to what um, what that vendor offers you as far as uh, whether it's going to work real well with Cisco or not. IPsec is a fairly open standard, so um, you know they're going to be pretty well in line with each other. Um, so IP security or IPsec. Is a, is a suite uh, or framework of protocols used to protect data crossing and network. It's not really a, well I guess it is a protocol itself, but it is and it isn't. It's really a, a framework set up for all these other little pieces of protocols to interoperate. IPsec operates at layer 3, so it can secure layers 3 through 7, a large advantage over SSL or, or SSH. Um, SSL and SSH actually operate on the transport layer, so um, the, you know, they, they're one one layer of uh, the OSI model taken out of what they can actually uh, keep safe. The individual protocols providing security can be changed as technology progresses. So that's one of the um, the foundational things and really important thing about IPsec that's going to keep it uh, vibrant for years and decades to come is that you know as we get better encryption standards or better authentication standards, those individual protocols can be dropped into IPsec so that they'll they'll still function. Here's kind of a uh, a very large overview, and we'll go into to each of these individually. But you know, IPsec itself is the the framework, um, you know, for for how this works. And you'll you'll have a certain IPsec protocol that fits in there, and then you can put any of these individual um, protocols for encryption, authentication, or Diffie-Hellman in there um, to handle the the smaller tasks. So encryption um, encryption ensures data can only be read by authorized devices using a key. Um, so how it works, clear text data is sent to the encryption algorithm, the key, and is run through a sophisticated mathematical formula to ensure it is unreadable. Um, the data is then transmitted across the potentially unsecured network to the destination device. The destination device uses the same key to decrypt the data so it can be read. Um, comes back in plain text. And actually that last little part should have been added to the next slide. Um, encryption uses a number of algorithms. Um, the three main ones are uh, DES, or Data Encryption Standard, DES. One of the first encryption algorithms used, it was de developed by IPM originally, it's 56-bit keys, and uh, it's considered weak encryption by today's standards. Um, then we've got triple DES, which, uh, you know, or three DES, which is exactly what it sounds like. It significantly improves upon the security of DES by running the algorithm three times. Um, the, the key to it is that it runs it three times, but it uses different keys each time. So you basically re-encrypt the same thing you know, three, three different times with three different keys. Um, definitely not impossible to crack, but it makes it a, a lot more difficult to crack than uh, standard uh, data encryption standard. Uh, and then the, uh, the newer one, um, the, m the more secure of these three options is the advanced encryption standard, or AES. It's a newer encryption algorithm. It's created by a Belgian uh, cryptographer group known as uh, Rij Nadel. It's a, uh, it was actually created in a competition by the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which is a division of the U.S. government. Um, it did two things. It increased the encryption strength um, to offer you know, 128, 192, or even 256-bit encryption. But the, the way the algorithm algorithm was written, in addition to being stronger encryption, it's also easier on CPU resources, so it's uh, it's not as taxing on the, the actual hardware. 